episode 14 and today has been 48 hours since we flipped to flower. I'm gonna walk around and show you all four quadrants so you get an update on what's, what's happened in the first two days. Now that we have a little downtime and we can relax a little bit in here, I wanna uh, discuss integrated pest management and all that it entails, not just spraying. But I will also be going over products that I like to use to foliar spray for integrated pest management. And I'm actually going to make one of those up today, show you the practices of how, that I, how I foliar spray, whether it is for nutrition or whether it's for pest management. On top of that, I want to address a few things that I've done. I need to garden every day and sometimes we can't video every day. So yesterday, if you've been following along, two days ago, the last video, we did the defoliation. Yesterday was the day after that, and I went in here and I did two things that weren't on camera. The first thing was I foliar sprayed with uh, in the morning when I came in with a growing organic product called GrowCal. It is a calcium product, but essentially at the beginning of flower, it's great to load up on calcium. I wanted to try the product out because I've only used it a few times, and I got a phenomenal plant response. We did a foliar spray in here using the methods that we'll show you. That product, I just used only that in water and I did a foliar spray. Aside from that, I did use the compost tea that you saw me brewing and that compost tea was different than the first one. You don't need compost teas to garden. You can just top dress, but a lot of people notice a benefit from compost teas and I enjoy making them. The plants love it. I also think there's one more thing I'd like to mention about compost tea. Successful gardeners put a lot of thought into their garden and that comes off as love and attention and I feel like there's a relationship between the plants. And so when you start to brew compost tea, you're taking advantage of thinking about your plant's health 24 hours in advance. And a lot of times that just leads to plant health because you're caring enough. So I'm not sure whether compost teas actually work or people that make compost teas or people that like their plants enough to keep them healthy, but we got a really good plant response in here. And that compost tea was our build a flower at one and a half cups, four gallons of water, and we did a third cup of a organic gem fish hydrolysate. So it's very likely that there was some fertilizer in that compost tea, more of a nutrient tea. Um, and that, that probably is what got such a good response. On top of that, we added one secret ingredient, which was just for fun, and it was from our health food cabinet. It was a 10-way mushroom blend, and we just sprinkled that in there. And I'm happy to report we had no negative effects from adding the mysterious mushroom blend. Everything looks really good, got a great response across the board. No burnt tips or anything from the compost tea. Here is quadrant one, and these are the earth boxes. I'll remind you that this one is a no-till earth box. So this one, we already grew a cycle in, and then we harvested the max stomper that we grew, and then we grew cover crop in it, and then we dropped the cover crop and covered it with compost and allowed it to decompose in there, and then we planted the plant. So this one is a little bit heavier. It's gone through slightly less water, one less reservoir full, I think. Um, but the plant health looks really good. It's keeping up. This is the 3.0 soil. And in the last video we top dressed, let me show you what it looks like under both of these. You're starting to get some of this reaction from the Kashi blend and the compost and the moisture. And if we were to really zoom in, which I do sometimes on Instagram, you can see predator mites and rove beetles and all of the things that build up the uh, ecosystem in here. And it's all working really well. I'll show you underneath here. They look a lot more similar now. Kashi's going crazy. You can see a couple mites in there. So don't let the uh, mites in the soil scare you. Mites in the soil are beneficial, and that's great to see. Um, plants look good. I've been doing a little tucking and weaving, so this one was sticking up. I bent it down. This one I keep bending. You'll notice in the last video I bent it to slow it down so the other branches jump up. You can kind of keep doing that, but I'm letting it ride at this point. So I'm not gonna be doing much more. What I will do is put a second screen on in the coming videos and show you how I continue the training. Over here in quadrant two, I did not do the top dressing. I just put the tea in here. We did the foliar spray, but I did not put the build a flower top dress like I did the other quadrants because this three by three has a lot more soil. It just takes a lot less work. Part of the no-till theory is that when we harvest this, we don't want to deplete the soil completely. And the benefit of more soil is a lot harder to deplete it with one round. Everything's looking really good. It reacted a little bit more wildly to the calcium foliar spray on this side. This particular plant has tried to roll the leaves a little bit the whole time. And it's showing a bit of this like intense jagged leaf edge. Look at that. And a little bit of a roll on the leaf. At this point, I'm not going to take it as anything negative. I just think that the combo of the calcium foliar and the tea this one's probably just a little bit more sensitive to the nutrients, but it looks very happy. So right now I'm just gonna keep everything as it is. Um, 
The mushroom log pretty much died out. We got two flushes off of it, and that was actually a sample that was given to me that already had a flush taken off of it. We will be releasing those in a few weeks, and we'll mention when they're gonna be available. It's been really fun to have under their growing mushrooms. Let's go over to quadrant three now. This plant, I defoliated it heavily, and it's already, you can see all the new growth just popping in from where those big leaves were blocking, and it looks beautiful in here. The plant that we overwatered is coming back with a vengeance. And you can see it's not only getting its green color back, but it's getting that full sheen. Looks really happy now. All the insides are getting new growth at all the little tips where I ripped the leaves off. So it's just trying everywhere it can to push out growth now, which means that we're gonna get a great yield out of there. It's not gonna be nearly as much as these other plants that weren't stunted, but we fully 180 that plant. It's very happy now. And I can start to water it more normally now that it's got a healthy root system digging back in there. And I will remind you that what we did to get that result was we brewed a very basic compost tea with warm castings and molasses. We used a, a sugar blend from Blue Gold, but we applied a small amount to the root zone and then we literally didn't water for like four or five days and it, all the colors started to come back. Sometimes the worst thing that you can do is try and fix it every day. Ultimately in living soil, one of the best things we can do is sometimes just back off completely and give it a little bit of space and um, she did everything we needed to, so I'm really happy about that. The rest of the plants, you can tell I pounded in. Like if you watch that last video, I put an inch layer, a half inch layer, a whole bunch of our Build-A-Flower. You can see there's no burning. None of the plant leaves are like showing any weird growth. So putting that much in the mulch layer, even in a smaller container, we saw nothing but a positive growth response. And now that we're going into flower, we're getting a lot of vertical growth. That extra material we put in there is gonna allow room for the fresh new roots to grow into. So I'm confident this trend will continue and we're gonna see really good things over here. Let's go to quadrant four. We also saw a great response on the pepper plant from the compost tea. Look at this, tons of new growth, tons of new bud sites. And if you look underneath, look at all the peppers that are developing faster than I anticipated. Pretty cool. I've not grown this variety before, doing really well. Um, on the tomato side, we're not doing as well. I pulled most of the fruit off and now we've put the nutrition in. I've been paying attention to watering a little bit more. I just think that these full-size heirloom tomatoes are not gonna be happy in this three gallon pot, but the new growth with the compost tea has jumped up significantly since the last time we clipped it. And we're gonna let the next uh, round of flowers set in and produce fruit. And we're hoping there's no bottom end rot and I'll update you as we go. We preach larger soil all the time. And there's a number of reasons for that, even with tomatoes, but I just wanted to address that. Over here on the rack, you'll notice that underneath these lights here, I removed the clones and it's because we're on 12 hours of light. I have a tent outside of this area that had a rack that was empty. I set the clones on there. I turned on a little light and we'll continue to update you as we start to see roots. Kale, you can see the compost tea that I kind of foliar sprayed on here, but lots of new growth coming in. There'll be huge leaves here soon. Uh, it's got a lot of turgor to it. They're not all droopy. And so I feel like we're gonna get plenty more kale out of there. I've not sown the radishes or done anything. We've been a little too busy. Once I get the rest of the vegetables out of here, I will be starting some new seeds. And that's when I'll put the radish in and I'll be sure to mention it. Uh, we did harvest lettuce out of here in the last video. You notice it's barely growing back right now, but it's been two days. And in another couple of days, it'll start to fill in and you won't even notice that, that spot. I mean, we've done this again and again, and it just keeps, keeps going on. Let's get into the meat of the subject and talk about the integrated pest management and that foliar sprayer that I really wanted to discuss with you today. I've got a number of different products. You don't need to use any of these, but they kind of fall into categories. So I brought them out to discuss the categories with you and how to think about designing your own pest management type of spray. The reason why we're doing this, we don't have any pests right now, but we'd like to be on a preventative routine. We always preach that. And when you grow from seed and you have the confidence of experience, you don't really need to put in a heavy preventative maintenance uh, program, especially when it's just your personal growth. We wanna follow our own advice and we're teaching to people that are brand new at this. And here's the caveat. If you don't know what a problem is, a lot of times before you realize it, it's too late. So we'd rather get you on a preventative program and eventually you're gonna to have to learn some lessons the hard way. And this will mitigate most of that. And as you start to learn, you'll come up with ways to actually eradicate problems if they, if they pop up. Right now, we're only gonna talk about preventative. And I'll mention a few things about eradication, but I don't have anything to show you since we don't have any pests in here. Another consideration to remember with integrated pest management, I want you to borrow some confidence from us. This is, I don't know how many back to back to back to back to grows inside our, our warehouse. Like literally our retail store is right here. Outside of these tent walls, our customers shopping right now, and they have no idea we're recording in here. 
but we let them look in here all the time and we want to show off the process so they can borrow from that confidence as well, which means it's not a sealed environment. I'm wearing my shoes in here. Customers peek in all the time. They're growers with their own home grows. I have hemp farmers coming in, vegetable farmers coming in. Everybody wants to see in here. So not only are we in the retail store, we have multiple people in and out of our grow, but we still don't have any problems. And I would have been very hesitant to tell you that five, six years ago. But after years of doing this back to back and having all these farmers coming in and out and just following our basic practices, we haven't had issues. And let me add another layer on top of that. At home, you should have probably one style going. In here, we put all four recipes with every type of compost that we have, some in small containers. We started over 2000 seeds and trays. We have vegetables going, which they say you shouldn't do with your cannabis. We have deep mulch layers with mushrooms growing that should attract all the fungus problems, right? We have decaying leaves. I mean, everything they tell you not to do in three succinctly different styles, earth boxes uh, that have this reservoir down below and no issues. And so what I want to drive home is not trying to impress you, but to press upon you how important it is to follow these basic practices. And then also when you see something and you want to freak out, like I mentioned the soil mites that are in the soil, don't freak out and start calling everybody say you have mites. What you're looking for is if you have a healthy plant, most likely what's going on is beneficial. The dangerous ones are gonna be living in the, in, in the leaf area. And for the most part, when you're brand new to this, there's gonna be some time where you're looking up on Google some sort of mold, some sort of bug, and you're gonna be freaking out. Nature has no bad, they just have things that do jobs. So if you have a spider mite, it's typically because your crop um, needed to be taken down in nature's opinion, or it was food for them. And so a lot of times people are surprised to find out that nature's working everywhere. Just because you started growing doesn't mean that it really cares. And what I mean by that is you can start from seed, have nobody over your grow and walk in and find spider mites and it'll piss you off. It's like, how did this happen? I didn't bring this upon myself, but nature abhors a void and it fills it with things. So what we've learned at build a soil is that we fill it with what we want. That's a permaculture principle. And then nature's less likely to fill it with things that you don't want. And um, by doing that, we, we put in, there are mites in here, there are rove beetles in here, there's worms in here, there's decaying things in here. And then we also keep up with foliar sprays. Some growers actually buy mites that are for the leaf area on large commercial. I don't recommend it for a smaller grow, but we're creating a army of warriors that are out competing. And that's very different than trying to create a sterile environment. So when people initially comment on these videos, whoa, you're wearing shoes in there? or wow, you're putting your leaf mulch in there, you're gonna have bugs. Good luck with all that different soil. Um, it, I get why people would think that. And there was years of people, in fact, Tweetment, the owner of Tweetment has a gardening recommendation, says no compost, no leaf indoors, we need to be sterile. We've learned so much since that era and there are some problems and there's some potential pitfalls, but I just wanted to share with you that this is easy, or it's simple and it maybe is for anyone, but not for everyone. And so if you're of the mind that says, I'm attracted to this, this is what I want you to do. I want you to know it's totally doable. We're not hiding any lurking secrets in here. And if anybody should have pests or problems with the thousands of seeds we started, all the customers in here, it should be us. So borrow from that and then watch us do these foliar sprays so that you can add another layer of confidence if you're new. Just doing this once a week can prevent almost any issue. Um, and if you've got clones because you really wanted that flavor or you just didn't know how to get seeds, you need to get like double time on this. You have to separate quarantine spray, do like twice a week, not just once a week and be on the lookout because something's lurking. When you start to get clones from other people, it's just, I don't know what it is, but it's like 99.99% .99 of the time there's a problem. So be aware of that. That's why we mentioned growing from seed. Other hand, when you're really lucky and you know a lot of great growers, you can start to trust certain people and get clones. I don't even really do that. <laughs> I pretty much don't trust anybody, but it is what it is. So uh, let's just get started. Integrated pest management is more than just a spray. And I wanna be really clear to address that. We mentioned developing an ecosystem. That's one part of the process. The other part is using your eyes, coming in here all the time and looking at the plants, looking to see if there's any intersex traits, looking to see if there's anything growing on the leaves, if there's any powdery mildew, if there's any pockets where moisture kind of keeping or there's trouble lurking. And that is part of integrated pest management. It's identifying and adapting and having a plan. And so part of the plan is to have, as far as the build a soil way, having three products that you like, that you can rotate through. They don't have to be gardening products. They can just be some Dr. Bronner soap or some Castile soap from your favorite supplier. It can be, heck, Dawn dish soap. We think that there's levels of quality, like Dawn dish soap is gonna be harsher on your plants than a Castile soap. But soap, 
can be a preventative. And so we'll discuss that. That's a single ingredient spray. One ounce per gallon of your favorite soap will work really, really well. And so I just wanna at least drive home that having three products that you either add things to or rotate through will create a function of difference in what the um, plants receive where you're more likely to have overlap in whatever potential problem you're trying to prevent. And that seems to be a great way. Now, when you go on the offense where you actually have to eradicate and you've noticed a problem now, an aphid or a spider mite or a mildew, now we're really gonna get down where we actually tighten it from once a week down to every day or every two or three days, depending on the type of problem. And then we also wanna make sure that with organics, if we're gonna do it every day, you want them to be gentle. And so you need to know how to apply them because the last thing you wanna do when you're eradicating is hurt the health of your plant because that will then spiral the pest's ability to take it down. So caveat with pesticide or pest management is never hurt the plant more than the pest would. It doesn't make any sense, right? The cure can't be worse than the actual problem or there's no point to it. So the, the spray that I'm gonna use today is our most gentle. It's called EM5 and it's a product that we make. It's more of just a plant cleaner. I wouldn't call it a pesticide at all. It's just to be in prevention. I do use it in between when I rotate other products to clean the plant to better receive the next spray. So that's another way to use it. But instead of me just talking about visual and integrated pest management, let's get right to the nuts and bolts and discuss the way that I wanna teach this today is categories instead of product brands. And so when you're making a spray, a lot of times the very basic level, Judam Wedding Agent, Castile Soap, Thermex 70, Saponaria, like any of the products that provide a soapiness to the water, you wanna have one of those in your foliar spray. So I, I brought several examples. Thermex 70, we just bottle it. It is a yucca extract. It is a saponin extract. This one looks dark like molasses, but when you use a small amount, it makes the water real soapy. And that allows the spray that you're using to stick to the plant leaves and effectively coat the plant. And good coverage is a very, very important part of organic practices. Instead of just you know, spraying some poison, we need to get good natural coverage. Now, another one is our build a soil sapin area, which we're actually designing a label in, uh, with J Plant Speaker. And we'll have a lot more details on this um, as we actually release that. But again, it's just saponins, which is that soapiness. And so another version is actually using soap. Dr. Bronner's is one that's really popular. This is a locally made product, Lactosopsilis. The benefit here that you won't find in a normal Castile soap is it's got lactobacillus in it. It's got probiotics. So that's why I like this one. Any soap that you have, one ounce per gallon is a great preventative and two ounce per, uh, per gallon is a good eradicatory type of spray. Even just plain soap will, will really pick up aphids and spider mites. So think of that in the back of your head. It doesn't have to be labeled as a pesticide for you to use something with different intent. But when we offer products to you, I can't tell you what can be used as a pesticide or not because we're not trying to mislabel things. I hope that, I hope that makes sense. And so now that we know that we need some sort of soap in there, um, that alone, the surfactant, the wetting agent, that will actually be a good IPM spray. Just by itself, saponins are really potent. You can do a lot of research on that. Now, the next level is adding something to that. And so to that, we can add essential oils. Um, home gardening concoctions in the past would say hot, chill, like hot peppers. Um, you can do organic alcohol or organic um, vinegar. And these are different ways of making things that will deal with powdery mildews and molds and actually um, make it inhospitable for the pests to want to hang out on your plant. And it's pretty gentle on the plants. So with that in mind, I'll talk about the next class. This is a blend of essential oils. It's got no label on it. It's because we just go to Liberty Naturals and we buy bulk, our favorite essential oils, and we blend them and they bottle them for us. And a lot of our customers use this as part of their integrated pest management. The reason why we do it, it's way more effective as far as cost per ounce for us to do it this way than it is for you to go to the grocery store and buy little tiny bottles of every different flavor. But if you've got essential oils in your house, you can just use a few drops per gallon and spray with it, or you can go as high as an ounce per gallon, but you must turn the lights off. Very, very phytotoxic. So another thing with foliar sprays is light can sometimes affect how it burns the leaf of the plant. So a lot of times we either want to dim the lights or turn them off. This is a essential oils or one you have to have to dim the lights or turn them off. So that's something you can add to your spray. And so now that we've talked about what you can add, be it chili peppers or vinegar or alcohol or essential oils, now I want to come to the last category and that's pre-made concoctions. Instead of you making your homemade special sauce with soap and essential oil and vinegar, we'll talk about the different classes of products that we have available. So this is the EM5. It's what I'm going to use today. You'll notice some familiar ingredients now that I told you how to make stuff. In here is organic EM. Uh, so this is effective microorganisms, EM1. 
and that uh, is the probiotic consortium that's used to ferment this into stability and it drops the pH. The sugars that we add to do the fermentation in here are organic apple juice concentrate instead of molasses and it keeps it really clean and plant-based. And then we use organic grape alcohol as opposed to using like Everclear or whatever alcohol you might get. This is a very clean source of, of uh, alcohol. We also use yucca extract in here. Um, and then there's also organic apple cider vinegar. We mentioned vinegar as a common additive. And then we also use organic peppermint essential oil. And so we've this is like all the additives plus the yucca, which is the wetting agent. And then it's been all fermented together into this bottle. And so it's become one of my go-to products. It's one of my favorites. Um, in fact, the tray, you can see has some algae in here. I'm going to dump some of this in water, pour it in here and shop back it out. And it's gonna completely clean my tray. I just use a little bit of a brush in the grooves. I use it to foliar spray the plants. I'm gonna do that at the end of the video here today. So look out for that. You'll notice that I keep mentioning how to make your own. It's because we've always started as a company that says, just go make your own stuff. And then eventually we get enough demand that requires a product like this because not everybody wants to make their own. They either lack the confidence or they wanna get like organic alcohol instead of just what they had on hand. So you don't have to buy this. We teach you how to make it, but this is a product that we do offer. We have an integrated pest management report. You can get it at buildasoil.com, a little uh, I think it's in our blog. You can also just Google build a soil IPM report and it'll pop up. Essentially, it's a lot of these recipes like how much to put of each ingredient. Uh, although I know I'm off the top of my head, you probably won't remember an ounce per gallon or a few milliliters per gallon. Um, most of that information is pretty easy to find on Google, but build a soil IPM report, great place to start with proven. This is treatment. This is the original enzyme spray. Now, a local farmer told me that this is a product that we should look into using. And he does some amazing things out here. He's able to uh, control weeds. He can't, he can't say that he kills weeds because he doesn't use herbicide and you're not allowed to say it unless you used an herbicide, but he uses some pretty cool organic tricks to foliar spray and make the weeds sweeter and they ferment themselves and the animals eat them. And since he's an old school head, I thought I'd listen to him and I bought some of this Safe Solutions treatment product. And turns out if you go to their website, they have an entire IPM like book that you can buy. Or, I mean, sorry, book that's free, a PDF. And they just share tons of really good information. I love the guy and he invented and patented the enzyme PestiSafe instead of pesticide, where you have an enzyme action that causes the insects to molt and they, they use that enzyme in here so that when you spray it, it actually, the pest can't build up a resistance to it. It's also got some boron in here, which is um, also used by people making all natural um, pesticides. And it's got some essential oil in here. So this is, very much a complete recipe, but it uses one trick that is hard to do as far as do it yourself, and that's the enzymes, and that's what makes it more effective. Enzymes are better used in warm water, so if I use this, I use clean filtered water and about 90 degree water, and it ups the potency. For regular prevention, you don't have to do that. It works great on its own. And I wanna reiterate, you don't need any of these products, and we're going over a lot of them because I'm just trying to share with you the reasoning behind them so you can learn the principles so that you can become an independent grower who can source anything from any company on their own by reading the ingredients or making it on their own, not become dependent on a product. To do that, I'd like to highlight all of our favorite products and why they made it on the list. You can decide what works for you. So Tweetment is the original enzyme plant wash. So we'd like to pay homage to them because they made a great product. Um, so anyways, let's go on to the next one. This is the next enzyme product. We actually have a three-way IPM kit, I think it's IPM bundle number three that comes with both of these and the EM5 at a discount. Amazing Dr. Zymes Eliminator, just simply the enzymes are a little bit more pure. And the reason why that's great is um, they tell people that you can spray this on full flowering plants without any negative effect. And for people that are dealing with powdery mildew or bud rot, it's great to have something that's really, really safe. Um, I'm comfortable spraying the EM5 or the Dr. Zymes on plants late in flower. I just don't like to recommend it. I don't even like to talk about it. I, I just don't wanna spray my flowers ever. But if you have to, there's things that you can feel that are more comfortable using. And an enzyme solution, 90 degree clean RO water, this is a strong product and it can go a long way. That being said, if you have a really bad infestation and you just kind of half-ass throw this on there and spray it and expect it to kill it all, it's never gonna work. You need to be diligent. You need to use the right temperature water, clean water. You need to do repeated application. More importantly, you need to have proper coverage. And we're gonna explain how I spray later in the video using EM5, and by that I mean I work my way from the bottom of the plant on the underside of the leaf up. I have some uh, tips there, so we'll get to that in a minute. Another enzyme product, really, really potent, works very, very well. Um, any enzyme product, really any foliar spray, if you're unfamiliar, turn the lights off or dim them. If you're in veg, just kill them. Turn them off for like an hour or two, it doesn't matter. If you're in flower, you can do it when the lights are about to go out, 
and then go in there right when they go out and spray everything and then they'll have the full 12 hours to kind of dry off before the lights come on. Until you know what's safe, just don't risk it. There's a few products like EM5 that you can spray with the lights on, but I would rather you just be safe in case your plants are a little bit weaker because of whatever might be bothering them and that could um, exacerbate the problem of the enzymes and actually really cause a bad problem. So keep it safe and simple. We covered enzyme sprays, soap, essential oils. Some people will use aloe. And the reason why I mentioned aloe is that aloe is one of those few plants that doesn't get any pest issues. It's kind of a miracle of nature. It also is high in saponin and it's used for health tonic reasons, for health benefits for humans. So a lot of people impart those same reasons to gardening and they foliar spray with this as their main preventative and they swear by it. Um, there are people that are eradicating fungal issues on uh, citrus using aloe. There's lots of different research out there that you can kind of go down the rabbit hole. We don't sell this as a pesticide whatsoever. We just sell this as horticultural aloe. It does have saponins. It's great for a foliar spray. And so oftentimes people will add this into their recipe um, for cleaning the plants, being preventative, and it adds a little boost of feeding them at the same time. Um, next we have Agsil 16H. This is a chemical. And it's one of the few products that we offer that's not considered organic, but it is approved for organic use for foliar spray. There's just a lot to it. Here's what I'll explain. This is made from sand, so we're cool with it. Next, they run potassium hydroxide over it, which is part of soap making, it's in soap, but that extracts the silica from the sand. And so you wanna use this sparingly. It can definitely have a intense effect. The reason why we all started using this is this is very alkaline and alkalinity helps emulsify oils into water. So when you have neem oil, which I'll explain next, which was a, is a go-to for organic um, pesticide pest prevention, the Agsil 16H is a potassium silicate product that you can mix in the water and the oil and it'll help blend the oil into the water. More than that though, potassium silicate on its own is used as a powder, powdery mildew eradicant. So having this emulsify oil help boost the plants with silica and help fight pests has been a reason why people look to silica for a long time. So when build soil first started, there was lots of silica products on the market, just as today. We found behind the scenes, there were just a little bit of this and some liquid sold on the shelf. And so this goes a lot more bang for the buck. We've carried it a long time and we're actually gonna make a label for it here pretty soon. So tiny bits of this goes a long way. Do your own research if you're gonna use it, but this goes great for emulsifying oil, powdery mildew and other reasons. Now. We don't sell it as a pesticide at all, so you're gonna have to do your own research as to how people use it. A lot of times it's just for fertilizer use, but that's Agsil 16H in a nutshell. Next we have wettable sulfur. This um, is sold as a number of different reasons. We are offering this one pound wettable sulfur just, as, just for sulfur use. The same manufacturer, Microthiol Disperse, um, they make one that's labeled as a pesticide with specific directions for that. And you can follow those to use uh, wettable sulfur as a pesticide. The main caveat with wettable sulfur is people say you cannot interact oil with wettable sulfur or it'll really hurt the plants. So be sure you haven't sprayed any oils recently if you're gonna use this type of product. Those that tend to use wettable sulfur kind of stick with wettable sulfur and they don't interact with the others. Because I like to rotate products, I never use the wettable sulfur. I just haven't had the reason to. Um, I will say guys on large scale that have rust mite issues and all sorts of problems, they swear by using wettable sulfur in their routine. So I wanted to at least have it as a mention here as part of the process. If I've got a major issue, a lot of people will bust out the big guns and they're gonna grab wettable sulfur and really go after it. And one more that's kind of the big guns is this product right here, Captain Jack's Dead Bug. The brand doesn't matter, it's just an affordable percentage. So in here there's an active ingredient, Spinosad. This is a mixture of Spinosin A and Spinosad D. That's what we're looking for, it's a natural bacteria. The reason why you don't hear about this a lot is on the commercially approved list of pesticides that you can spray on cannabis, this is not one of them. And I feel like it comes from a lot of the outdoor growers that spray this on their flowers late for caterpillars. I wouldn't recommend doing that. In the dense buds, this is never gonna um, go away and you might have Spinosad in your herb. I'm not terribly scared of it. I just wanted you to know why it's not commercially approved. That being said, for the home grower, if you're in veg and you have some thrip or spider mite, this is the nuclear organic bomb. It is just like one dose and happy praying plants, no more thrips. You also spray the soil surface where some of the um, larva might be and that eradicates them as well. Even though I say one dose works, most people use two or three doses just to make sure they got good enough coverage because that's, that's the limiting factor there. Really, really potent, really good product. Because it's a listed pesticide, we oftentimes don't talk about it. We like the homemade concoctions. I love keeping this around as a secret sauce just in case. We haven't had to use any in here. 
Thank goodness. Neem oil gets a bad rap, and mainly because a lot of times when you find neem oil at the store, it is an inferior product. And what we're looking for is we tested at the lab for the level of azadiractin. Now, there's hundreds of limonoids and different special properties of neem oil that we're after. It's just that azadiractin is the highest constituent, the easiest to test for, and it's used as like, hey, if this is a high number, all the other good stuff we're looking for is probably going to be in elevated numbers also. Neem oil oftentimes in the United States when you go buy it at a hydro store is going to be anywhere from 200 up to maybe 600, 800 parts per million of azadiractin. Um, and they'll have a combo of A and B, but that's pretty low. We can get product that has 3,000 parts per million. I mean, it's significantly multiple, multiple times more effective as far as active ingredients, but most of the time they're not sold as a pesticide. They're just sold as neem oil and we're just looking to get the most premium. So that lack of information and the fact that it's all wild harvested from India leads to a wildly different um, uh, levels of product. Because of that, what the industry has done is they extract the azadiractrin, not the other hundreds of limonoids, just the aza, they pull out of the neem. And then they buy really crappy neem oil that may be old or not as good, and they'll infuse the azadiractrin extract into it and market it as a neem oil, and it's called manufactured neem oil. That stuff is also inferior, and we don't know what just azadiractrin will do to you. We like the natural synergy from unadulterated, cold-pressed neem oil that's wild harvested. That's the quality level that we bring in here at build soil and we've tested it a whole bunch of times. We can talk about it, but big, 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 big difference. When you use this at like an ounce or two per gallon, you get a phenomenal response. The leaf have a dark, deep sheen and shine to them. It's often sold as a leaf shine. Um, and it gets a bad rap, but if you have a problem, neem oil is like the go-to. It coats the leaf, it's long lasting. The plants really enjoy it. And the only thing that you have to remember with neem oil is it's liquid right now because we're in the warm. If your house is a little cooler, it'll get solid. And so all you do is put it in hot water in a bath and just let it soak until it gets liquid again. And then you need to emulsify it, which we discussed. The emulsification process, I've got videos on YouTube you can check out, you can use a blender. Mainly what we wanna do is get either a saponin extract or a soap and make sure the oil's mixed with the water. And a lot of times that's why we use the AgSale 16H. Um, again, our IPM report and our YouTube videos will go into more detail about each product, but I wanted to give you the full gamut and the IPM conversation today so that now you know neem oil is still a go-to. It's not just some bullshit that you've heard from a grocery store that doesn't work. It can really, really set back a number of big problems, but they're organics. So you're not gonna just kill everything in one go. Like if it's a spider mite, they lay eggs every few days and they hatch. So you need to hit your plant every three days. Um, you could rotate between the Captain Jacks and neem oil and some of the others. And I promise you, if you put in the elbow grease and you do good foliar sprays and you stay on top of it, you're gonna eradicate your problem. And then you're gonna use that memory to prevent in the future so you never have a problem again. And I promise you, following these basic practices and then coming up with your favorite two to three products to have in your toolbox to rotate through, that'll save you all the headache. So I hope that helps. Let me mix up the spray that I wanna spray today. And the good news is we're really healthy in here. I get to keep it super simple. We're on the preventative tip. All I'm gonna do is open up this brand new bottle of EM5 and I'm gonna use this as a plant wash today. And I'm gonna use, um, you can use, like if you look on the back, one ounce per gallon of water is the normal use. Might be hard to see on camera, but for dunking clones and young plants, you can use two ounces per gallon. And for heavy cleaning, you need to use two to six ounces per gallon. We have customers that use the heavy cleaning dose on their plants and swear by it. And they say it really keeps them ahead of the game. I just use an ounce or two and that's what I'm gonna do today. So um, I'll show you how I do it. I've got one gallon of water in here. And um, a lot of times you'll see me using like a measuring cup or a scoop here on camera. I never do that at home. Organics is pretty gentle. And so I'm just gonna do like I do at home. I don't have a measuring shot glass. I'm putting one to two ounces in here just by drop into the gallon. There's one ounce, two ounce good to go. When it's gentle, you can kind of overdo it. Not really a big concern. When you've got a few plants, this one little jug will last me like way longer than I need it to. So I'm not worried about the budget on that. And now I'm ready to spray. So I put it in my sprayer. There's a reason why we use these metal sprayers. They last a long time. They hold about the right amount of water to carry around fairly easy without being too heavy. Um, but any sprayer will work. The reason why we use one with a wand is probably the most important point is that we can now grab a nozzle. This is a 0.5 gallon per minute nozzle. It'll be a finer spray, so it'll slow down the volume and it'll evenly coat the plant. Some people use a fog. They want even finer than this. I think this 0.5 gallon per minute is fine enough. 
And now what I can do is I can actually start on the underside of the plants leveraging the wand, where if you just have a pump spray bottle, you're gonna be spraying down. Very hard to spray up at the plants. Couple tricks if you've got a spray bottle at home and you don't have a wand and you need to spray tonight, you can lift with your hand like this while you're spraying to spray the back side of the leaves. And since it's organic, you don't have to worry about spraying your hand. You can just move the plant leaves like that. I'm gonna show you what I do. I put the two ounces in here. I'm shaking the water. Again, not above my foot because these chapins will really break your toe if it slips like that and releases. I'm gonna pump it. And I've only got a gallon in here, so I'm gonna pump it a little more than normal to build up that extra volume of pressure. And then what I do is I get a little bit, oh, I had some compost tea in here last time. So there's some in the straw. It's really easy to release a, a leak on these. See the compost tea? Now it's clean. You can see how much I don't fear the compost. <laughs> it's spraying, you can see like in a fan wave there. I'm gonna go flip it upside down and I'm gonna focus on spraying underneath the leaves here. The reason why is that's the side where it's going to be having the most issues. A lot of times spider mites and mildews and all this stuff, they're gonna hide in the lowers on the underside of the leaf. So I wanna start under. The reason why I start under is as soon as I spray the top, it droops the leaves down. And then I won't be able to access the lowers anymore, which is a problem. And since I've thinned it up in here and there's not as many leaves as normal, it makes it incredibly easy for me to get good coverage. First thing I do if I notice a problem like powdery mildew or spider mites or anything, is I would defoliate the problem leaves immediately and get them out of there and then spray the rest. A lot of times people will leave all of them on and spray them all. Get it out of the grow, spray the rest. So that's all I need to do. I'm just spraying all the underside of the leaves. And now that I've got the full unders, I make sure I get the tops and everything. I mean, really thorough. I mean, this is talking water and EM5. It's not an expensive solution. So make sure you really coat these plants. They can be honestly like sagging from the weight of water that's on them. And that's why having a, a trellis does help. But I'm getting them fully covered. And then now that I've done the underside, I go back to the top. I usually shake the can a little bit. EM5 stays really well mixed, but like neem oil, you wanna make sure it's emulsified and constantly being shaken. Now I'll do the top. And so right now I don't have the lights dimmed, but to follow my own rules, I'm gonna reach up here and just dim this. EM5 is so gentle, you don't have to, but I just want to make sure you have the best chance of success and there's no reason not to dim the lights right now. So I'm gonna go spray the rest of these. I don't think you need to see uh, me doing every one of them. I'm just gonna start on the underside of every single plant, then I'm gonna spray the top. That's the routine, I'll do every single thing in here. One last consideration, even with EM5 or anything, you can always spray the mulch layer. I don't because I've got no issues, but if you want to, it's not gonna cause any problems. I'm not watering with it, I'm just spraying with it. Other people will literally spray the tray, spray the container. They're just trying to make it inhospitable from the essential oils and the soaps and vinegars for anything to be in here that shouldn't be in here. We're in preventative mode, so I don't have to take it to every nook and cranny, but you might want to, especially if you're brand new to this. Good sprayer, good coverage, a mixture of products that you time at least once a week when you start without issue, and you should have a really happy, clean garden. I hope that helps. I try to cover all the details, but like always, I'm gonna forget something. I'm gonna miss an important question that you might have about making your own sprays, and I don't want you to have to buy products from us. So if you have a question about it, ask them on this video. That'll remind me to maybe share some links, anything like that that might help. If you're trying a new product that you've never made before and you don't have experience with, try it just on one little plant that doesn't matter, on a small area. Make sure there's no negative reaction, and then use it on the whole garden. I'm confident in this EM5, and so are our customers, so I'm just gonna get after it. And I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for following along. If you've got something that works really well from you, we'd like to hear about it. There's a lot of homemade sprays out there and sometimes the best way to learn about gardening is to share from others that have more experience. So if you've got a spray that works, share it on here. And then uh, on top of that, if you've got like a funny story from a spray that you may have used or something that went wrong, share that here too. We love to learn from each other's experience and that's part of the benefit of social media. Thanks for following along. Make sure that you comment, like, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.